Board of Directors to order. Mr. Minchin. Uh, I had an agenda item I'd like to add. Uh, I'd like to have a discussion about um, uh, maybe a short term, a short contract uh, to help review bids for the uh, playground. I'm going to add that to the agenda at after number five so that we can have the parents to the office today. I've also added a item to the consent agenda for a new food service truck. <coughs> uh, the first item on the agenda is public comment, and there are some folks here. Um, if if you're here for item five, you don't need to <coughs> be part of public comment now. But if you if anyone has public comment on something else, no. Okay. Um, all right. Moving on to the consent agenda. They were figuring out whether oh, they really are it out. number five or not. You are number five? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. I should have said that on the consent agenda is approval of the minutes for May 16th, approval of new teacher contracts, approval and signing of bond documents, approval of MHS roof bid, approval of tax anticipation note, approval of the AFSCME side letter agreement and adoption of the tobacco prohibition, education records, student alcohol and drugs, and limited English proficiency students policies. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, thanks for all the explanations of that material, Brian, in the memo. And um, I, I understand we all need to sign things. Okay. Yes. Okay. So actually, let's we're down to just two more that needs to sign. And so if Lisa and Brian take care of that, I will just grab it back from my room. Fantastic. Thank you. Jim, Tina, and I'm now ready to sign. Okay. Great. Um, and the consent agenda also <coughs> included the. Um, teaching positions and the <coughs> service director, as yes. Brian indicated Thank in the you. beginning. Um, the next action item is the warrant process and approval process, number four. Grant, do you want to come and speak about that? Since you're doing two things at once. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were over there. <clears throat> sure. So. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Superintendent Wicked gave some brief description of what this is related to. In the law book, 16 VSA 563, under powers of the board, it basically, in a nutshell, says the board is responsible to approve the, the bills that we pay, and who, who we're paying them to, and how much we're having to pay, and then provides that approval to the treasurer, who is then responsible to make sure the bills get paid. And so we just wanted to have a documented process in place where we can tell our auditors, this is what we do. This is how we handle it. So um, as outlined in, in Superintendent Ricca's memo, we plan to continue to have warrants run every other week. Um, we are asking that you approve or authorize the chair or vice chair to sign the warrants on behalf of the board. Um, we will keep track of every warrant that gets approved. So for example, during the summer, if you're not meeting, we will keep track of the, the warrants that the chair or vice chair have signed. And we will make sure that those get on your next board meeting. And then we will have documentation that shows the board approved the warrants. We will have somebody's signature on those warrants. And we will use those warrants to provide to your district treasurer. And then she can make sure the bills get paid meaning her signature will be on the checks that go out. So it was, it's just kind of a simple housekeeping thing so that I can document that you have agreed to this process. So I believe there was a suggested uh, motion to approve the warrant process as outlined and to authorize the chair or vice chair to sign warrants on behalf of the board. And I'll be glad to address any, it's really just documenting what both prior districts right. probably have already done, but just something that I can show that we did actually talk about it and have the process and we'll follow it. Any questions for Grant or the superintendent? That's the way we've been doing it mm -hmm. for everybody who hasn't been mm -hmm. doing it. 
and we may not have, we may have missed a couple of warrants that got signed you know off cycle whenever me meetings got canceled and that's something we want to make sure that we clean up and if the auditors come in we want to be able to show here's where this warrant was approved here's where this one was and be able to have all of them and maybe a number sequence that we can make sure so it's very clear so we can't have had that many warrants coming through at this point in the district have we you have had none. We don't have one yet. Would be <laughs> right. Right. So yeah. very soon we will start having them, and it'll be during the summer when you're not meeting on a regular basis. So it's uh, something I needed to get documented before that happens. I wouldn't say that too quickly, that we're not meeting on a regular basis this summer. Yeah. <laughs> I think we probably are. Okay. <laughs> That's There's a suggested motion in uh, the memo. Can someone? it it's on page two I will I move that we approve the warrant process as outlined and authorize the board chair or vice chair to sign warrants on behalf of the board second I'll second that any further discussion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed <coughs> thank you thank, thank you, you Grant. Grant. thank you Grant. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda number five is a parent request um, which you have in your packet from and please let me know if I'm saying this correctly Dwayne and Rachel Natvig um, and uh, Dwayne and Rachel Natvig are here um, and you are welcome to come up and speak with us if you'd like to we have um, we have your request and we've read it if you um, we're happy to to hear from you if that if you'd like to speak to us about it You can either sit or stand at the microphone. As long as you're at one of the microphones, it's fine. Well, uh, I think the board's decision has to be based upon what's best for our son. And that really boils down to continuity uh, because he's already a seventh grader and would be forced to change to a different school between seventh and eighth grade. And as I believe his name is Mr. Dale pointed out <coughs> to your in previous meetings in April last year. Uh, smooth transition has always been the goal of majors. <coughs> and uh, grandfathering has has been the way that, that has happened. And our son was already uh, in a different school, you know, as you mentioned in the minutes, uh, uh, he wouldn't, most students wouldn't want to start at another school, but he did. He started at the beginning of sixth grade, and he was actually enrolled in seventh grade on March 27, 2017, uh, which is the defining time mentioned in. Article 40 of the, of the merger, and we ask that you uh, see that as a literal interpretation. It's kind of like fundamentalism, I suppose, but uh, the, the intent might have been to say attending, but it didn't say attending, it said enrolled when he was indeed enrolled well in advance of that deadline. And we <coughs> implore you to allow him to continue at school has been very good for him and um, that's, that's the main thing for us. Thank you. And, and I would just like to add maybe with a, a little bit more clarification that I, I think our request is based on looking at the agreement as it was um, accepted in the merger um, and the wording does say that your child be enrolled um, by the certain deadline. So I think it's, it's that wording of enrolled um, where we're having um, possibly the debate um, is centering on that. Um, he was attending the sixth grade, but he was enrolled to be in the seventh grade by that date. So the letter of the agreement, he meets the letter of the agreement. He was in fact enrolled to be in the seventh grade um, prior to your deadline. Um, he was not attending seventh grade but he was in fact enrolled in a in a different school district 
thank you for coming tonight and for your comments. Um, we're going to open it up now for the board uh, to discuss your request. And Murray, you're, welcome, you're welcome to sit down. Okay. You can stay there at the table, it's fine. Um, I, yes? I'd like to begin by saying that the, um, in reference to what the first statement was, the merger committee truly understood the difficulty of children um, going from one school to another at any point, and it was uh, a rough conversation, but we had to make a decision about when that would be. So we appreciate that, but we didn't make a decision. I, believe. I understand. So I understand that they're asking for us for the the district, and therefore the taxpayers, to be paying for tuition to Waldorf for not one year, but all remaining years of the student's career? Mm -hmm. Six years. To be grandfathered in, per the letter of the agreement. I mean, it really was, as you had mentioned, when the board went through, excuse me, the study committee went through this discussion, and we spent a lot of time and a lot of meetings talking about what the cutoff point would be. And it really felt like the most tenable to both existing districts was that cutoff period for students who were going to be in seventh grade already. So when those students graduated sixth grade last year, which would have included your son, I know he wasn't in the village school, but would have graduated sixth grade last year, it's those students were essentially encouraged by the way that the articles were drafted to move to Main Street Middle School this year so that there wouldn't be a forced transition this coming year. Um, so we felt like between all the study committee members that the best route was moving those kids at that point in time because there was no technical forcing uprooting somebody from an existing situation. So I think the hope had been by the study committee's behalf that in situations like yours with students who are going to be entering eighth grade next year, that they would have already been in Main Street Middle School so that there wasn't this potential disruption. Um, so that was a lot of the intent of the both existing districts and the study committee to be able to come up with a solution or a situation that would be tenable to most people. And we really do, and it's tough talking about an individual student, we really do have the best interests of all students in our district, including your sons, at heart in our discussions and decisions. So, it kind of gets lost when talking about one specific kid. But, you know. And, and I, I don't believe that we're asking you to revisit the discussion because I obviously you know we've, we did read the minutes of the notes and we understand that you have you know looked at this and you've considered um, what the um, cutoff needed to be. Again, I think what we're asking you to do is as per the agreement when it says that your child needs to be enrolled by this date and then in fact we do have documentation that our son was enrolled for the seventh grade by the date that's listed. So we are following the letter of the agreement. So we're not asking you to, to make a different decision, we're asking you to honor the agreement that you made, um, that's, that is written down. I think you're trying to force the creation of a loophole that was never intended to exist and isn't consistent with the intent of the committee. I think the fact that there is, yes, I know, some people have more legal expertise than I do, but I feel like the fact that we're talking about a private school instead of a public school changes the situation a little bit. Um, so in my mind, you know, as every student gets near the end of their current grade level in a public school, it's expected that they would be continuing on to the higher grade level the following year. You know, the families don't sign a contract in you know, May that my fourth grader is going to be a fifth grader next year. Um, it's kind of assumed. They just so show up. Right, so it's a little bit different, I think, in this case, since it's a private school versus a public school, and the fact that you know those families in a private, excuse me, a public school situation don't sign a formal contract. That, yes, my kid is committing to grade X next year. Uh, I could be maybe wrong in that argument, but I feel like no, I'm, a I'm confident factor. that the committee meant enrolled meaning in that grade. <laughs> So, and as, as the board knows, we've had, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. We've, we have had two other requests now for tuition waivers. One, basically the same type of request, and the other for someone who um, wanted to attend the Northfield schools. And the board has denied those requests just in re recent weeks. Um, Peter, go ahead. This isn't specific to this case. It's more of a general thing. I have a lot of problems with using public dollars to, to send kids to private schools. 
I really do. I think I think it's I think it, it creates a big problem for us, not the least of which is that the private school in question will set the rate for their student. And we pay that no matter what that rate is. So if we could just start, if, if our per pupil costs are less, that means we're using taxpayer dollars to, sub, to further subsidize private schools who have less, less regulations, less things they have to teach, less special needs kids regulations. I mean, it's a big problem. It's a big drain on, on the state's education fund of public dollars is going to private schools. And, um, and if you're talking about doing this for 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, six years, you know, that's a serious ask of, 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 of taxpayers in this district. Um, you know, no, I'm not saying private schools are bad. If people want to send their kid to a private school, that's their right. But to ask the rest of the taxpayers to pay for it, potentially depriving the rest of the district of, fun, of additional funds is a big problem for me and one we should take very seriously if we were to consider this. All of these multi-year cases of tuition requests, I just feel like it's too much to take that level of resources from the district. Yeah. It's yeah. a very, oh, go ahead. I just would say, I hear your argument, Peter. I don't, I don't think it matters whether it goes to a public school somewhere else or a private school. Either way, it's, it's still, you know, those, that money leaving the district. I mean, accepting as far as um, decision making. It, 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 it is different because when the, we, the, there's less, there's, the, okay, yeah, I hear what you're saying. As far as I would say, if I could just throw one in for a I would say whether, whether it might be different, it's probably not a basis on which we can make a decision. The impact on our district is the same. That's fair. Regardless, right. and that's the. I think as we make this decision, it's important to frame it not in terms of the best interest of one child, but in, term, in the interest of the best interest of all the children in our district and the best interest of the owners of our district, who are the, who are the people who live in these towns and who um, contribute both civically in terms of volunteerism, but also in terms of financially, in terms of taxes. It's a balancing act that the board is charged with making. We take that role very seriously. And we are not able to, to favor one person over another in that process. I also think that um, the, the, one of the problems with these is that they're such expensive asks. I think that we're talking about, every time we consider this, we're talking about about $100,000 for one person. And um, it's not something we can do you know, like, like to say, waive some books or something like that. So it's a very expensive request. The other thing is, I think it was, it's very clear from, from the board deliberation or from the committee deliberations that consider this merger that what the intent was. I think it was very clear what we were trying to achieve and it was um, that, it, that it was to not, to give, as you say, force, those, force that conversation within the family early so that they would have an opportunity to make a decision to not disrupt their child um, any more than necessary. And some, some parents did not exercise that option. Um, and some may have, I don't even know how many did. And so <clears throat> I think that we did do a really deliberative job on this, trying to find that balance. And then we took this document to the voters of both districts, asking them whether they agreed with this. And they overwhelmingly in both towns said they agreed with this, frankly, compromise um, between the towns about how this was going to operate. And so if you look at it from that perspective, high stakes, um, many constituents at, 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 uh, has an interest in this, a, a good deliberative process, ratification by the, the taxpayers and the, or the voters. I think we have pretty solid grounds to say that we have, we have really taken the best interest of not just this child, but everyone in, when, we, when we do this, and that we are not, and that we're being very consistent in what we're doing. Great. Can I ask a sure. clarifying question of you, Steve? Yeah or I guess the whole board. Um, do, do you think the public, um, when they were voting, thought, do you think people were informed as far as um, that it would be mean enrolled in seventh grade means currently in seventh grade? Was that something that I think there was a lot of conversation. I had a conversation in Roxbury about that, and I think 
um, people were clear and people who had concerns came at that time to voice it when we were having the discussion. So I think it was clear. And I, I would say people in Montpelier were concerned about it too because mm -hmm. the, the issue of Montpelier voters paying for the tuition mm -hmm. right. was an issue and there were a lot of conversations clarifying why some students were grandfathered and who would be grandfathered and we when that would stop. We had all those color-coded step right. charts. We did. <laughs> Did you want to add something? Well, I just wanted to make a small correction to something Peter said, uh, and that is uh, the grandfathering tuition payment f from by public districts uh, is not complete to independent schools. Uh, it, it is true for other public schools that uh, the sending district would pay full tuition, but it isn't true at all for independent schools. There's a significant difference. It's subsidization for sure. And I also wanted to say, uh, Steve sort of implied that people who send their children to uh, independent schools haven't supported their community. Well, this isn't true at all. I mean, I've been paying taxes and supporting Roxbury School for 35 plus years. And uh, I don't know, it just seems like We're, we're asking you to consider the disruption of an educational path that a denial would bring to one student, yes, and yes, he wasn't in the Roxbury school system when it, discussions may, possibly were made clear to other sixth grade families that you better transition quick. Uh, but, uh, like we said, he, he was enrolled. If you wanted to say attending, you should have said attending. That's just pretty simple English. And the meaning of enrollment is pretty simple too, and from Webster's anyway. And um, I just want you to think about his welfare and not just about dollars. And I, and I would ask for clarification. You said it's $100,000 per student, and I'm, I'm not sure where that number comes from. Is it fifteen or 16000 per student per year? 16. 16, 16 times well, a year. Well, not, not to an independent school. Not to an independent school. His tuition um, subsidy last year, or this, this current year, was like 11000 It's right? lower That's for elementary. And it goes so it's up. a little bit different. So, way, um, Lori, correct me if I get this incorrect, but so the state has it's a dollar amount um, per education for the students. If a student in the Roxbury District, when the Roxbury District was operating as a choice district, would pay that amount up to the state dollar amount. Right, and then anything above that, the parents or the families would be responsible for paying. So for if, independent schools, not for the public. Right, independent private schools. But right, isn't so, it Despite, regardless of what the district that's that's tuition that, uh, that's paying the tuition would have charged for its own tuition, you're saying that it's the state average. Yes. yes. Is it but the isn't yield? that a decision? Like or something? Is, is it the yield that they? Isn't that a decision, Lori, by district? Because when I was principal of Washington, it was a decision Washington made how much they would pay to a school. It was the average. It's been Rockbury's to pay the state average. Right. So the district makes a decision. And isn't that figure higher at the high school level than at the yeah, elementary level? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do just want to say that we, and I think I probably speak for the board on this, that these have been very difficult conversations for all of us every time one of them comes to us, and, and I suspect this is not the last one, because we understand that when parents like you come, you have the best interest of your child at heart, absolutely. And we <coughs> have to balance that with our responsibility as fiduciaries for the district and, and our responsibility for all the students in the district. And it, it's not easy, and, and we understand that it's not easy for you too. Um, is there further discussion? Or is there a proposal for a resolution? Do we have a motion? There's no motion. No motion so the these are difficult so to I frame the motion. Ask for a moment of clarification. You want us to accept the spirit of your intention and um, the legality of um, honoring the letter of the intention is not 
something that you feel compelled to honor? I, so now I'll switch to speaking for myself. I, mean, I, I feel comfortable that that um, that the both the spirit and the letter of the agreement were addressed to students that were attending seventh grade. Um, so I, that's that's where I land on this. Um, I don't think we're um, dishonoring either the way the agreement was written or what was intended. But I, and I do think it's very very clear what was intended by by the committee and what was communicated to the voters about how this would work. And there's also just there are significant fairness concerns, um, given that you know there are many families in your situation, and there are some that would prefer to go to other schools. The voters made a choice that that the Montpelier Roxbury district is not a choice district. It's a it's a district where students attend the public schools. <coughs> Anyone? <coughs> Or we, need a we received a request. So right. In the past, we've addressed these by with a motion to direct the superintendent mm -hmm. to respond. respond. That's my recollection mm -hmm. of how we've done it on oh, the okay. others. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Is that am I right, Ryan? Ryan's the parliamentary. Let's let up for. Let's see. Do you it's listed request? as a discussion. It's not listed as an action yeah. item. So, right, we shouldn't need to take a vote. It would be a recommendation. It would be fine. I'm sorry. The, the uh, don't we have to act on it? Right, I, we would take. It. We, I thought that we had voted to deny the request in the other. Is that what we did? Sense, but I'd have to look back at the minutes. I thought we had to. Right. I am wrong. Made a motion to deny the request for the writers. Okay. And I and all okay. of this, I wrote the letter to the Soligny's exp, explaining the board's decision. De decision and briefly summarizing the board's deliberation. And the decision had been made by the board at that point. It was yeah. kind of sending it back to you for a decision. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Apologize if I misspoke. That's okay. It's been. Okay. Is there a motion on the table now? No. Does anyone want to make one? Brian just made one. That's what I thought, but he said oh. no. I'm not making sure. a so I'll make a motion then to deny the request presented by the Natvik family. And I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you for Thank coming you in tonight. <laughs> Um, we're moving on to policy discussions, and we have four policies for first reading. Title I, comparability, animal dissection, which I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Title I, parental involvement compacts, and the board member conflict of interest. Um, since it's the first reading, my, my proposal is that we go through them one by one and see if people want to raise questions, issues. Um, things that we can talk about or get more information on in the second reading. So starting with Title I comparability. And Tina has a pen out, so I strongly suspect. What's up with tobacco through? We adopted those adopted on the consent the agenda. Okay. I know fast. I know fast. Great. Great. <laughs> okay, comparability. Here we go. Here we go. So I'm ready with this one because I really don't understand it. It appears, and I'm really... Um, pouring the idea of required at the top. It appears to me that this policy counters the intent of the Title I law. So, um, for example, I think Montpelier's done school-wide use of whatever little Title I they've gotten. I'll, I'll readily say if you targeted and ranked, everything we got would go to Roxbury. That's just how targeting and ranking would go. But the point is, the point of Title I money is to give extra money to schools that are, do not have as much, um, that have a low, a higher population of low socioeconomic groups. And it appears that this policy um, undermines that or counters it. It's not, it's um, supplanting is what I guess I'd say. So I don't understand it. So I'm because, up for explanation. Because it's saying, it, can, I, can we go back to before you ask your question one second and 
just make sure that I understand. So if, for example, um, Union Elementary School has enough low-income children to receive a Title I grant, then um, we have to provide, and that allows us to, say, have a free before-school program mm -hmm. for those students. Then we also have to provide a free before-school program at all three other facilities. Is that what this policy is I'm not is sure saying? that it's that specific. It's saying if Title I gave $500 to Union School, yeah. then we as a local would have to give $500 to, to each, each of the, the other, other schools, schools to make it fair. And the whole reason they gave $500 to Union School... is because of the pre-existing unfairness. Right. So you're undoing that. It, it, the way this policy reads to me. So I, was, I kept reading it thinking, I don't understand it. Do Title I funds, in theory, make up for a lack of funding in a particular school because of the lower socioeconomics of that town? It's not actually a lack of funding. It's the idea that a population of more so low socioeconomic kids might need more things. More support. Sure. Yeah. More support. And that was the intent of the original Title I law. Does it make sense to take a pause and ask the superintendents to give us some more? Sure. It's a required it is a required policy. I mean, what I will say to Tina's point, our school wide, we're, we are doing school wide now, and um, Mike is working with Michaela, the two curriculum directors, to ensure that our continuous improvement plan does include Roxbury. And now that we have a fourth school, we do have we do have to do targeting and ranking going forward. So. Um, Perhaps, perhaps what we should do is pause on this one, let me go back with Mike and Michaela and Lori and reevaluate because previously MPS with only three schools did not have to do yeah. targeting and ranking, and now that we have four, we do. And we set these policies up before we were informed through the CIP that we were doing targeting and ranking. So, well, can you explain <clears throat> that it says it's required? It implies to me that right. it's required and to do it, and it really is. To and be that's going to give law. me a chance to follow up on that one as well. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. And right. Thanks. Also, a required policy: the animal dissection <laughs> policy. So the gist of this is that um, students can't be required to Correct. dissect things. That's really all it is. And that we should provide an alternate method for them to learn whatever was supposed to be learned by Correct. The dissection. Correct. Mm -hmm. Great policy. All right. Now Can I ask for the shout to will change yes. on this policy? Thanks. Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. This is just about animal dissection, um, and not to embarrass one of my children in front of her <laughs> one of her peers but she, she had to leave biology because they were um, taking their own blood and in class I don't remember what I'm not need bio okay so it's cool <laughs> they, so they and they had an AP bio lab in which the kids took their own blood and she had to leave um, and the teacher was great, but a different teacher might not have been. Mm. I don't know if we have a way to fit that into the animal dissection policy. Animal yeah. dissection animal or human experimentation. I think we have animal dissection because the legislature requires us I to have a policy that lets right. students That's out of dissecting animals. Like I, I don't yeah. think there's been a broader discussion of what should right. we and should we not. Can we also let them out of Peter other Peter Waterford <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know that we have a policy about it, but it has always been the custom. For example, if um, there is a discussion, um, mm -hmm. a sex education discussion, and your child wish and you wish them not to attend that, you can opt out with and get that information in another manner. So. Is that a is policy, that a policy? or a procedure? I was, that, well, that's what I was just going to ask Brian. I don't know what that falls under, Brian, but I know there are other instances in which that happens. I would well, say it's a parent. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I'm not sure I've been asked to that, really. I, mm -hmm. I would, Me either. I, I don't know the answer to that question, whether we have reached out to parents in that way or not, but I would say it would be a procedure. 
you're certainly welcome to make it a policy, but it isn't currently mandated as a policy. But this one has to be a policy. This one does have to be a policy. Yeah. I, mean, I think the key to this is not so much the topic as the notification or, or the notification of the rights, this, which comes at the end of the procedures, I believe, is that this is a unique situation in which there's a proactive notification. So and an alternative education method. Sure. Right? But I think that that would, that would follow. You know, we often see where, I mean, I, at least at the younger grades, you see that um, parents will warn families that something's coming up, like a movie mm -hmm. or something that they like, you mm -hmm. know, if you don't want your child to be subjected to this or whatever, just let us know. And I think what follows from that is, and we'll come up with something else that's equally educationally valuable. And I think um, what's unique here is that there's a requirement that everybody be notified of their rights. And I think that, you know, like with a blood draw, it's interesting because I, you might argue that it's in this category, um, at least tangentially. And so maybe, you know, you, it would be ideal if the, the <coughs> teacher would warn everyone, hey, if you don't want to do this, it's okay, and we'll come up with another way to do it. I don't know. But um, I think ultimately for families, that's the issue is I didn't know I, had a, I, didn't know I could say no. And um, I don't know that I want to extend that to just generally controversial topics, but I think that, you know, I might not even put this in here if I, was, if I wasn't in the legislature, if the legislature didn't make us, but it does. So it's about the warning, I think, is the focus on this, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to be harmful to warn people of their rights. Perhaps we could say this policy is all right and we will take under consideration blood draws and various human <laughs> things for another time. <laughs> Any further discussion on animal dissection? It was surprising to me that it was part of the class. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, moving on to Title I, Part A, Parental Involvement Policy. Uh, which again is a required policy um, involving our obligations to make sure that parents um, are involved for parents, parents of students receiving services and programs under Title I. Are there any questions about my only question comments, about questions about this? It includes the sample compact as well. That would be part of the policy as adopted. Yeah, you know, and, and as, again, as I'm looking through this, it has references to No Child Left Behind, which has been amended to ESSA. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to suggest we pause on this as well, simply because um, it's, out of date. it's out of date. So um, I'm going to, we're going to have to go back and look at this one as well. Okay. Fix the type in the first sentence, please. Thank you. And the, yeah, I was going to say that, um, as an editing thing, there are all those numbers. It didn't make any sense to me. Two They're footnotes. Two oh. It's because the footnotes are not superscripts. Oh. That took me, that took okay. me a minute, too, I but I think that's what's going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a strange yeah. format. Mm -hmm. That's a typo. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. There is no six, though. Oh, yes, there is. Oh, I got it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Board member conflict of interest policy. Um, this was in the packet once. Well, actually, I think this has been in the packet a few times. It was, <laughs> yep. it was never got to it. It was discussed by the board um, at one point in, as part of a much broader discussion. And um, just for some background, I think it, there was a point at which the policy committee was thinking of having a code of, of trying to get a code of conduct policy that included the conflict of interest provisions potentially and have, have a discussion about that, um, which might yet be a good idea, but. Um, that broader policy discussion keeps getting postponed. And this is a required policy under state law. So we began to get concerned that it has to be in place for the district. Um, so this is the standalone standard conflict of interest policy. I have one question about it. Yeah. On the back, under complaints of conflict of interest number one, upon a majority vote of the remaining board members or upon order of the chair, the board will hold an informal hearing why, why would we give the chair the opportunity to, let's say presumably the majority of the board members don't want to have this hearing, but then we let the chair just say unilaterally, well, too bad, I want this to happen. Is that what we're saying? 
That is what it says. So yes. I, I'm not I just the what's the rationale for giving essentially the board chair the unilateral authority to decide if there's a hearing? Why would we just know. stick with the majority of the board? I will say that we should be careful, and that's why we're doing this on a first reading. We should be careful because there are required provisions under the law okay. for this. We have to make sure that before so we question, change anything that it's not something that's in fair. the statute. Um, it would I don't have an answer It would for just that, seem like it potentially would open something up if the, if the board chair had potentially an axe to grind against this one person, they could start dragging this thing through. I'm not saying what happened. I'm not saying this Jim's going to do this. I'm really not saying Jim is going to do this. Right. Oh, right. but Michelle might have. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, the previous chair, boy. No, no. But in seriousness, the majority sounds like a reasonable position. If it's not required by law, it seems like the majority would be the way to go. Yeah. It, it may be uh, just Steve was in next, the interest actually. of Steve. time. Uh, it, it could be that. It could also right. It could also be, and this is these these provisions where the rest of a board brings one board member up on charges, kind of thing, and then everybody becomes the judge and jury for that. It gets really squirrely in a fair, in a highly dysfunctional board where the majority yeah. can be acting unethically, right. and the chair may say, "You know what? We need a hearing here." And you know who the judge and jury is—the people who aren't being accused, according to this policy, right. which is also getting a little squirrely, right? So yeah. now you've got. So now this is it's not. not. I think I would read okay. this that the the board, if a board member is making the complaint, they are also not. They're also excused or recused. It says of the, the remaining board remaining. members. Yeah. So I think remaining yeah. would be okay. the person who's accused and the person bringing sure. it or yeah. out. So it's just a mess, right? And I think oh, we God, have to just awful. hope that the yeah. that the odds are low that it would ever become a mess and just you know. okay. The other thing is, remember the chair, chair does serve at the at the leisure of the of the rest of the board or of the board. So it could be at any point replaced if the board chair made, did something that was. It's true. The majority himself. can oust the chair. Are you so, saying we should get rid of Jim? <laughs> <laughs> when he's Since I'm the here. vice chair, I'm definitely not saying that. <laughs> my sense is okay. if, if, there's, if it's even close to being required by statute, don't mess with it. Yeah, I agree. Even I agree. if it isn't, I don't know if it's going to really matter. But Okay, uh, fair enough. I see how it now goes both ways, so thank you for that. I would like to know what an informal hearing looks like. Yeah, yeah. that's what I I don't know the answer to that. You don't have to wear a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, to, me, it, to yeah. me, informal applies you're not going to make a decision or you're not going to decide, so why would you have it? After Then you go to ABC, you're going to make a decision. It, it may mean that it's not a um, formal, like, uh, like a tie. Uh, a, a, a administrative Procedures Act hearing. Maybe that's why it says informal, but I don't know. What you could just get rid of the word informal. <laughs> we should ask the question, or it may... I'm happy. I mean, I'll definitely take responsibility for figuring out what in this policy is required by the statute. Um, oh, that on my plate, everything else is great. But, um, it definitely is moving in the right direction. Um, I mean, I, I also love the end of it, which is the board members should be formally censured or subjected to such other action as may be allowed by <laughs> yes, law. Yes, by law. <laughs> anything allowed by law <laughs> is on the table. That's on the table. <laughs> if it's How not illegal, we might do it. Pulling out fingernails. Is that allowed by law? <laughs> It's a, it's a strange, strange policy. Um, In fact, I mean, isn't it circular a little bit too? Is that what could you possibly do that would be allowed by law? I don't know. And and does it actually where it says the member should disqualify him or herself from voting? Does that actually mean they have to, or is it just should. the board <laughs> saying? Oh, that's an old one. <laughs> <laughs> it would be good. If, it, it's morally true if you should. Yes, yeah, but it's a. But for instance, if they said we're gonna we're gonna remove you from the board, is that allowed by law? Or you don't have any authority to do that. Or you're gonna skip them. We're not gonna let you look, attend the next meeting. That's not really. That's yeah, not allowed by that's law. Not allowed by law. Like there's nothing you can do that's allowed by law. Right, you're well, an elected well, official. Well, you, there could be criminal prosecution if it was something truly like crazy. But we can't. Unethical, right? We don't do. We that. don't do that. Right. So, <laughs> so yes, Michelle. Even form. Formally censured. Does that just mean like we hereby censure yes. you? Yes, that we is what that means. We have put the word censure yes. on paper That's what it in means. association with your name. It's under yeah. your name tag. If you censure, <laughs> 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 That's scary stuff. I guess there. by law you yeah. could, from then on, list them on the website with censured on this date. <laughs> that would probably be allowed by law. So there are ways to publicly shame people oh. officially. Oh. All right. All right. So uh, can we just move to accept it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's um, three for second reading. 
uh, the first. So the goal here, I think, is to see if we've resolved any questions there right. so that, that these could come back for adoption. adoption. Um, student attendance. Oh. There was a question that had been raised about this policy, I think, by Ryan, that about why it said legal pupils. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Brian gave us an answer in the memo, which mm -hmm. was that um, some people attend your school who are not legally obligated to attend school. Correct. And the attendance policy may be different in that situation. Correct. Did anyone have any more questions about that? No, but when I read the first paragraph again, it says legal pu pupils between the ages of 6 and 16, right? Okay, got mm -hmm. that. Then when you go down, it says, further, it says students who are over the age of 16 are required to attend school continually. So what are we saying? Are we saying that between, uh, when I read the first sentence, I thought, okay, after 16, this doesn't apply. But then down below it says, when you're over 16, it applies. Why does it say it twice? Well, it's a different, different sentence, because the, yeah. in the criteria for mm -hmm. 6 to 16 is excused from attendance as provided in state law, and the criteria for over is different, mentally or physically unable mm -hmm. to continue or excused by the superintendent in writing, which I guess could be for any. So the superintendent the super reasonable. can excuse somebody if they're over 16, but not if they're under. Is that what it's saying? Mm -hmm. I think it's giving the superintendent much more mm -hmm. authority to excuse an older okay. student. Right. Mm -hmm. Then I'm necessarily cabin. Right. That's what it seems like. I know I wasn't here when this was first know, read, so I'm going to ask about the shall and will thing on this one too. Mm -hmm. And then another um, semantics is the that we use pupils and students in this one, and I believe more current policy is, is just students across the board. So getting some consistency on that. In this is, that policy. Is, is that because of the legal pupils thing? I think that might be. I can check. Well, it says, yeah. No, no, There's no, also pupils. pupils below. Is pupil used again somewhere besides that sentence? I mean, it's, in, it's the title of the next one, Pupil Privacy. I know, rights. in the next one. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. yeah. <laughs> huh. it, are, are, is it a proposal that we should change legal people to students? Well, maybe we or? should clarify if pupils and students mean the same thing. And, There's a difference. And because I'm looking at pupil privacy rights, and part of some of this language uses student also, and some of it uses pupil which maybe it doesn't really matter, but. It's interesting, I, and I don't know if it's up to date, but I do wonder if part of, in the next one, it's driven by the fact that the federal law has people in the name that's of it. That's what I'm kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Sure. Sometimes, I love consistency. Sometimes <laughs> if, if you get you thrown a right. wrench because other sources Some are not right. consistent. consistent. Right. Well, yeah. my thought would be, could we be consistent and not be illegal? So, for example, in the pupil privacy rights, could we just use all pupil? Right. Or is there a reason to use students? That's just a question. The student is just a better word. Yeah, I <laughs> in like terms it. Of common That's words. what I mean. It <laughs> yeah. makes more sense. Um. Legal pupils in Title 16, but they also talk about Students, <laughs> right? And they do it. So they do it, right? Um, I, I, I would not. Yeah. Yeah. On that one, it's the definition. <clears throat> so we'd have to use it in that one. It certainly sounds like it we probably should. Seems as though should. they're they're yeah. mixing it up just as much as we are. I have Unless one a suggestion. Yes. On which one are we on? Back on Back student on attendance. Student okay. attendance. <clears throat> Where it says legal pupils, you could say students between the ages of 6 and 16 who are legal pupils and who are residents of the school district. And make it clear that you're referring to the definition in the statute. Doesn't that suggest that there might be students between the ages of 6 and 16 who are legal pupils? Right. Yeah, I Which thought is that was the, the whole reason we were using Oh, that, that is true? Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, I thought the definition of legal pupil was between six and no. 16. No. The whole reason we're using legal pupils is because there are students who are not, who do not meet the definition of legal pupil, but this applies only to legal pupils. So, uh, so you can be between six and 16. Ah. In that case, illegal. if that's true, I like your edit, and that makes sense. Legal pupil means an individual who has attained the age of five years on or before January 1, next following the beginning of the next school year. However, a school district may establish and enforce a regulation which requires that students admitted to kindergarten have attained the age of five on or before any date between August 31st and January 1st. So that's the definition of legal pupil, 16 VSA 1073. But didn't you Once you're admitted you to kindergarten, you become MLs legal? That we have people here who are not legal people? There was, right. Who would that be? That's, that's your people. Oh, I that thought. That are not legally required to attend. Where is this? It says we may have. I don't know that we necessarily have them. That statute contains exceptions for school attendance for students not legally. Is that like four-year-olds? Or? I thought it was the people over 16. Wait. Can can I get help finding where in the memo this is? Page, yeah, page, page two, two in the middle. Student attendance. Oh, yes, okay. I mean, I mean the definitions that they go through are teen parent education program, non-residential teen parent education program. Well, we also okay. An individual who is not a legal pupil may be enrolled in a public school in a pre-kindergarten program offered by or through a public school pursuant under the adoption of and it references other. Well, also lots of kindergartners are five. Right. Right. So. Well, does, but does that mean if for some reason we took a four-year-old in kindergarten, they wouldn't be a legal student? If you made an exception to the. Yeah. If it, Laura, are you going to complicate this or are you going to make this better? Well, Title 16 is always twisted tail. Um, so this legal pupil is, there's a definition that Brian just read of legal pupil. But when it comes to the attendance of children, that's under 1121 in Title 16. Yeah. Attendance by children of school age required. A person having the control of a child between the ages of 6 and 16 years shall cause the child to attend a public school and approve the recognized independent school level. So, that first sentence is combining That's right. two things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that is really what it was intended to do. I almost think you should point that out to BSPA. Wow. What, if, what, if the, what if the policy said that, you know, referenced the statute and said students who are required to attend school under Section 1121, blah, blah, blah. Then speaking and using the term child. Mm -hmm. Not student or um, pupil. pupil. Mm -hmm. So it's really children between the ages of 6 and 16 who are residents of the school district and not resident <coughs> pupils who enroll in school districts are required to attend school. Mm -hmm. So the, the other thing I'd like to point out is these are required policies, not necessarily required wording. Mm -hmm. The VSBA gives you a model, but you are not required to word it exactly. It's just you're just required to put up a policy. Right. That it's is true. Vetted by legal counsel and such, and that's why everybody's right worried about it. But as the, as the guiding policy. But maybe they miss something. I would use children in both of these for both legal pupils and students who are over the age of 16. I would say children between these ages and children who are over. That. I get hammered all the time for saying that you shouldn't refer to people in high school as children. Probably more adults. Yeah. Essentially all it means is that anyone who's enrolled in the school needs to follow the minimum number of days. So right. It, Correct. it doesn't even matter if you're a resident or not or what age you are unless you're under six, I guess. The kids, they gotta go to school. Yeah. Gotta go to school. Can we just okay. put that in the first sentence? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're not ready to adopt this one. We've yeah. been hearing a lot of questions. Um, so, Brian, are you able to um, take this one back under advisement mm -hmm. and look at some of these ways to get consistency, mm -hmm. figure out the application of 1121? 
a hold both on student attendance and pupil privacy rights? No, we haven't even discussed pupil <laughs> privacy rights. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> trying to go too fast. <laughs> My recollection is that this one is largely required. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of federal references. Lots of federal references on this one. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd like to comply with federal law. Mm -hmm. uh, I always love these opening statements that we intend to comply with the provisions of the People privacy rights and I operate on the understanding that we like to intend to comply generally with the governing law. <laughs> if we want to put it in a policy, that's good. It's interesting um, that it's an intent and not a will. <laughs> it is. Yes. Right, it is, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, again, this, this requires the development of administrative procedures, and the Montpelier District already has these. Correct. And I, Roxbury already has them, so that the new district will need the procedures as well. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions about this policy? Will and will. Are folks comfortable with this one being on for adoption next time? Any objection to that? Okay, none heard. This one will be on for adoption next time. Responsible computer internet network use. Uh, Ryan, I know that you had some questions that you wanted to raise about this. So, unlikely. Am I, was this the right one? It was, yeah. Mike and I spent a good bit of time talking about this. Yeah. And when we talked about, when this was up at our last meeting, the policy that was presented to us was a good bit different than the VSBA policy. And none of us had any chance to get any feedback from Mike's team on why it was different. Um, so we did have some, we did spend some time talking about that. So I had some background to, to fill in. Um, there was one question about one of the changes that I had that I wanted to raise. So ultimately, the theme of some of the changes are presented to us. Um, the tech team, let's see. Did you guys ever, did everybody see the, the email that Mike Martin sent out a couple weeks ago? Did that come across to everybody? Um, I saw it come by. Uh -huh. Right. Um, so he filled in a little bit of the background of where the policy came from. They've spent, they've spent more than a year working on this. Um, even before the merger had happened, Montpelier's existing policy was pretty weak. and. I think they approached Brian about working on it anyway. So the tech team, which involved um, himself, a couple of the principals, a couple of teachers, and some of the IT staff, all sat down regularly and worked on this. So they had spent a good bit of time going through it. The only thing that would be somewhat different from a structural standpoint is they added the stakeholder responsibilities. There's a full table that involves school board, superintendent, administrators, et cetera. Um, that's really the largest change overall from the existing VSBA model policy. His, let me see if I can quickly summarize what they were talking about and why they decided to do this. Um, so a lot of this stuff is what we kind of expect to see maybe in handbooks, um, going out to the parents every year. But the team felt that everything in here was important enough that they were hoping that the board would be willing to consider putting in policy so it was in one central location so that it's constantly fallen back to as a reference. Um, so their hope was that it would be included in policy just for that fact that it's not going to get lost between years in, say, the mainstream middle school handbook going out to parents. Um, so that's really why this is in here. There's nothing that is a problem. I was surprised. The one thing that did throw me off about the table was they had community members listed, the very last mm -hmm. stakeholder group. And that one kind of surprised me because it felt like that was a bit of an overreach for the board to be writing policy that's going to influence random community members. 
Um, but Mike did have a good justification for that. And I didn't realize it, not having a student in any of these buildings in Montpelier yet, um, how often community members do use the networks here. Um, between, he mentioned a lot the Flexible Pathways program and how students are interacting more with community members here and there and that people will come specifically for accessing the Wi-Fi network. Um, so in my mind, it kind of changed the, the rationale for having that in there instead of us randomly making policy that we want the rest of the community to follow. It's the community is coming to us and using this resource, so they should, be, right, they should be aware of mm -hmm. some of the things that they should be paying attention to. Um, so you have, you know, overall, the theme, everything was very similar with VSBA. They updated some of the tech terms um, the VSBA model policy was not in alignment with what's actually happening on the ground in these buildings with tech itself. Um, the only thing, Mike and I did talk about it a little bit, that caught my attention that I did want to raise to the board was point five in the procedures. Um, they have presented us a statement that reads a process whereby authorized persons may obtain specific permissions in order to access online resources necessary for educational purposes. Um, the pull up the VSBA policy has that worded a little bit differently. They presented a process whereby authorized persons may temporarily disable the district's internet filtering measures during use by an adult to enable access for bona fide research or other lawful purpose. Um, so there were two theme changes that the tech team presented. First, again, was just a tech update. Um, the, VSBA's internet filtering measures removal, that that's just not up to date with how things are done in the building. Okay. So they updated the, the work language there to be more consistent with what's actually happening. But then changing the end from the research or other lawful purpose to educational purposes. When I had read the VSBA language, I had really felt like they were talking about outside individuals coming in for whatever reason. I'd use the example of maybe like a researcher at UVM coming in to do research on maybe what high school seniors are accessing for their research project or something, as an example. And Mike's interpretation was, what they presented to us, was it's specifically focused on, it would be MERP staff. So it's gonna be teachers in the building being able to change some of the permissions to access different things, specifically for a classroom, like a teacher or a staff person making those changes. It has nothing at all to do with any outside individuals coming in. So of all the changes they presented, like I said, I, I would sign off on everything they presented to us as good work, good improvements from the existing policies. Um, it's just that change in five that I'm not totally sure the, the intent is the same across the two. Um, well, five says obtain specific permissions, which I don't remember you reading from the other policy, and that implies to me there's some process by which if I want to override your rules, I, I might be able to do it, but I need to get permission. And I'm assuming that in the procedure, there would be some way that I would get permission. You know, you, I'm thinking of, you might make a regulation in elementary school of some specific word you're putting up that you can't search. And then somebody wants to do some research and that prevents them from doing the research they right. need to do. So like the example he would use would be YouTube. Um, so I think YouTube must be blocked by a filtering program in most of the classrooms. But if a teacher needs to show a YouTube video for a educational classroom experience, that individual teacher can get access from the IT team to use YouTube in her classroom computers or whatever during the day for that right. one time. That's so it is giving one specific person permission to do one specific thing. Steve had a question. Yeah, Steve. A couple thoughts, one on, um, Ryan, the other thing on that procedures five, was the dropping of the word temporary. And I guess the word specific may cover that, but I think the word temporary is kind of an interesting one when we start giving permissions. And I, I think I would be more comfortable if the word temporary was back in there. Mm -hmm. um, just the idea that whatever permission we give <coughs> is gonna also specify the date at which it expires. Um, the other thing is, I had originally read that as, as sort of like the, the internet service provider or Google or, who, or whomever might, they're, they be the persons or whatever the word is. But now I see in, in procedures two, there's also a provision for that. And, it, and there's kind of an interesting reference here and I don't really understand it. And it might be because I didn't read this thoroughly. But um, provisions, so uh, provisions necessary to ensure the internet service providers and other contracts comply with 
with emphasis, applicable restrictions on the collection and disclosure of student data and other confidential information. What are the applicable restrictions? That if they, well, enc if they encounter any student data, they're certainly not privy to do anything with it, but continue to move along. If they're, if in the course of our um, um, ac giving access to Wild Branch as they upgrade our servers, they encounter student data, they have to treat it as hands off. I mean, that's, they, they would not be able to take said data and do anything with it except take it from server A and move it over to server B. And that's what applicable restrictions means? I, I think applicable restrictions is the people privacy, privacy rights policy. Okay. Um, so then I guess I wonder, what is our policy on the sharing of student information with Google? That's the that's the thing that people privacy right? It is? All right. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Number, six, number six. Okay, thank you. And then the last thing is um, the stakeholder responsibilities that Ryan drew attention to. Although I totally understand why a committee might want this thing codified forever and ever and ever and ever in, in school policy, I'm still not quite sure that it belongs there. And, uh, you know, I hate for any good work to be lost in the to the bookshelf. But uh, it also does... You know, I don't know. Just, in other words, I'm just kind of seeing as weird too. That's all. Okay. And I think if I could, we'll speak for Mike. But again, I think their hope was that we would be able to, by including some of this language in policy, set a goal or a vision for the district in terms of striving to reach these things. So again, it really was, I get it. I mean, I'd ask them that specifically. We didn't feel like this felt fit in policy perfectly, but that was what that tech team had put forward, is mostly just trying to, again, make sure some of this stuff doesn't get lost, but also to be able to create something that essentially is a striving for the goal to be obtained. Mm, that's, that yeah. might be the way to I would echo that as well, and I think it, you know, I, I would encourage the board, after this good work on policy, that you set up a process by which you review what you have on the books, and at some point you may get to a place where you say, this was great in its inception and we needed this stakeholder responsibility chart, and now we feel like we don't anymore. Um, but I, I would agree, I think, I think it's something, since it's not the boilerplate that we typically use, I think um, it gives a little room to, to reach for and to grow. And I like the way that was stated about um, that it's an aspirational thing, or a, a, and maybe that's all I needed to kind of get understand why it needs to be in here, and perhaps that could just be added a little line about it's not you know this isn't stakeholder law, this is stakeholder uh, uh, what you call it strive for, you know aspirations expectations Ex or yeah it's almost it's expectations right but sure. it's, or it really is it's what we all expect from folks but it uh, for some of these groups because they are a little more. Uh, part way under our auspice, it, it's more aspirational, but uh, expectations is probably reasonable. But some kind of reason mm -hmm. why it's in there, just along with the heading, might be all of the answer. Do others agree with that change of responsibility to expectations? Or mm -hmm. I'm, or I'm have fine, a fine with it. <laughs> or have a different suggestion? Mm -hmm. That's fine. I think it's fine. I'm not okay. sure I have a better adjective to. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is a much more minor point, but most of our policies say Montpelier or Roxbury Public Schools. Done. So, and I don't think we need here and after, though, because I hate Done. that word. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, the um, we talked about this last time, the, the mission being oh, yeah. left yeah. off because technically we don't have a mission yet. Got it. All right. Just leaving it as yep. just taking an actual mission. Got it. Yeah. So, so what was discussed last time? So it's just going to end at education. So it's going to end at educational mission. Yeah. Right. Yep. Until such time. Until such time. Until such time, 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 time. we have the mission. But understand. below, they've got they've written educational mission at the bottom of that page. That's why. Right. So we would be removing the italics. And would we oh. would we be removing the heading of educational mission too? <laughs> does that make sense? Probably. I think it does because. Yeah, right. that's what I was. Sorry. Yeah. Because then we have purpose, policy, procedure. Mm -hmm. That's just the policy. Bridget. Yeah. In, so 
I was just thinking in the legislature there's this process at the end of the session by which there's a, there's a review process where every piece of junk law that got passed goes into a, into a group. It's, it, I think it's under, yeah. it might be under judiciary, it used to be under ledge council. And it basically gets reviewed for consistency and formatting mm -hmm. and renumbering and making sure everything fits into the statutes. Yeah. And looks consistent. Wouldn't that be great if we did that with the I district? I don't know, and, and that's they, they're I not allowed. They anything that's even remotely substantial, they don't touch. Yeah, right. That's we what could probably enact that kind of a of an authority somehow. I'm guessing they it's, hired it's non-substantial. Right. Well, they hired Jessica to do that in the Ledge Council. <laughs> and yeah. So we'd have to. But several people look at it. It's right. not just one. Yeah. They have to kind one. of everybody has to pour over the stuff they the, and make sure it all works. And that there's no one's messing with it. You know? I don't know if we have authority. I don't know if we can actually say it, it would just be changed without the board voting. But it would be a very simple process to just have them all come back at one meeting with oh, little, red, little red lines, and we en masse just say, right. "Now we're revising them all." So they all say, and "Here's our style guide." We use. <laughs> they all say, "My Billy Public Schools," and they all say, "What must or will?" Anyway, they're in the same, anyway, they're in the same, they're in the same font. Maybe <laughs> nine months from now, we need yeah. to go do that, right? Yeah. When we're done with everything. Right. That's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. On my calendar. <laughs> yeah, Steve, you want to work on the style guide? <laughs> I might. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the frustrations I will just add is that the VSBA model policies do not follow any style guide. So we're, we're working with raw no, material that's it's not exceedingly that's different. Not consistent. But Heather puts them all <laughs> to the right style and font consistently. Yes. <laughs> Once they're adopted, they're in the right style and font. Right. Mm. Is this ready for adoption yeah. with the changes that we just spoke of? I'm game. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ryan, for doing the follow up on that. That was very helpful. All right. I think firearms is on a third reading, so we're not proposing to adopt this tonight. Um, you bet. Thanks. Um, in the first paragraph, uh, first sentences, the last two words are at school. So does that imply that it's also on school grounds? So at school is like in this building or? Yeah. It's in this um, definitions. Firearm school the are defined fire. consistent with the definitions required okay. by state and federal law. So I don't know what the law. state and federal law is. So is that on school grounds? I feel like we talked about that when we were at Rockstar. We did about, last time, um, but what did like these? a shooting club or whatever. Well, that was a diff that's, that's another a different question. Gun I think we talked about the school. Rack, in the rack um, of the pickup. It's all covered by statute. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Party yeah. Mode. Thank it's you. Included. Thank you. That's it. Okay. We tried to mess with it. We Any failed. school-sponsored so, yeah. event. The club Thank issue you. is a different question, for which I'm not different sure we have an answer tonight. We do not have an answer tonight. Whether recreational good. activities can function consistent with this policy. Um, I guess what I'd suggest is that we put it on for possible adoption next time. Policy, but contingent, you know, answer. and if we yeah. have an answer that people are yeah. happy with, we'll adopt it. If yeah. we don't, we won't. Okay. Is that good? Okay. Okay. We talked a lot about changing these. We can't, but we decided, but we, decided we, can't. we can't. Oh, we can't. Those are in the statute. Those are in the statute. Yeah. Yep. 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 It doesn't have that title you were talking about either. The Montpelier, Roxbury. Did you want to? Where's it? It says public. Montpelier, Roxbury, oh. public school. Yeah. Okay. Um, and look. Oh man, we're on time and everything. Oh, so Bridget, go. Yeah. Number nine. Yeah, on agenda item. Oh, I missed it. I was, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Why don't we do that now? Steve has okay. added an agenda. So just, okay. Uh, my intention is to, to perhaps make a motion, but I wanted to have a quick discussion about it. Um, I was approached by um, Sarah McKiernan, one of the uh, members of the committee. Is that her last name? McKiernan. McKiernan, yeah, okay. And she... Um, uh, and just said that, you know, they've been talking about this weird timing where June is the time everything's going to happen, but the new facilities person doesn't start till July 1. And what they're, what they're feeling is that there's going to be a discontinuity in this, and they would like to see if we might be able to support um, uh, bringing Andrew, the new facilities person, in for a, a very short, 
very limited sort of engagement to be part of the review and selection process of the contractors. She said that she had talked to you, Brian, and that I don't know if you advised against it or just didn't, I don't know what. So she, I, I, didn't, I didn't get the details. So I want to make sure. I any conversations with Sarah about none. this. Okay. None. Zero. Right. I, I'd be happy to. Right, exactly. So um, <laughs> she just said she knew that we were going to be in a position where we had to make, where this is going to move fast and it's going to fall in our laps very quickly. And so she was hoping that we would authorize some sort of an expenditure. Um, Jay, um, who's, I don't know what his exact title is, but playground Project guy. manager. That's um, he's, um, he's talked it over with the committee, with Andrew. It seems like it's a really easy arrangement to make. Um, the idea would be that um, Andrew would come in, he'd have a seat at the table while they're reviewing bids, bids, reaching a decision on which contractor to choose, assisting with the negotiations over the contract to get the numbers right, um, and then that would be it. And um, so that, uh, not that he would be making decisions, but he would be sitting in the group that did. Um, and help with that. Uh, they thought that um, they thought something like uh, if we set a maximum of 20 hours at the number they came up with, $50 an hour would be ample, and that that would be a um, it's like a thousand dollar expenditure, and that that kind of thing would really kind of bridge it and make sure that the new person knew everything going in and was part of it. Um, I don't know how to proceed at this point. I think I'd like to make sure something like this happens. It doesn't have to be precisely that, but that somehow we, we authorize that we can get Andrew in before his actual contract starts, maybe as a consultant for this, if he's up for it, which I think he is. Anyone have any thoughts? Brian, you first. Maybe. You could advise um, or authorize me to pay Just make it happen. Andrew LaRosa up to a not exceed amount of X for work to be done to ensure a smooth transition, specifically around informing decisions about the playground contracts. Could that could works. you trade days? In other words, could he? Could you say we'd like um, him to work three day three days worth in June for three days off sometime during the year? I wouldn't do it's that because, contract, because that way. Con that, yeah. that'll mess with this. This is pre-fiscal year work. Yeah. I, I think if yeah. you... It's just it's a it's separate it's type of relationship. Right. Contractual it'll just, yeah. And it has nothing to do with his per diem at that point. Yeah, it'll this be on a 1099 or whatever. Right. And it's going to be a whole different thing. Yeah. Is it an MPS decision then or not? Yes. Oh! Oh, shoot. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it is. Oh, yeah. It totally is. Of course. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but I, we're not. You all right, can't. I think. Okay, without a direction. I think it's clearly within the superintendent's I, I, like discretion. I can make amount. this happen. I can make this okay. happen. Okay. This can, Problem solved. This can get done. Thanks. Great. Okay. Lisa. Awesome. Good job, Lisa. Good job, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just sitting here listening to all this. Like, I don't even need to think about this. And then the Lisa spoke. And then the Lisa spoke. All right. <laughs> It appears that everyone, I, have. I don't know if they're all in cahoots on this, but they all have at least at some level discussed it and feel like it's a very workable range, including Andrew and Jay. Okay. And Andrew, we want to stay ahead of schedule. I think we're going to try to keep get Andrew to come to the special meeting next cool. week as well. Well, the th so the 8th is the deadline for all these things to come back in, and then we're meeting on the 17th, right? 14th. 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 Yeah. So, like, this is going to move so fast, and we have to, like, sign off it on the 14th, right? Correct. So, like... He's got to be on board by the ninth. He needs to meet. give us a recommendation ahead of the fourth. He's meeting. He meets with Tom Wood already regularly. Okay. And this is on both of their radars that this meeting has been scheduled for cool. next week. So. Okay. Great. We okay. can make this happen. I think it's that it's that ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth kind of thing is what they're worried about. Okay. Yep. All right. The next item on the agenda is an update on the superintendent evaluation committee. I'm thinking that's you. You might think that, but, um, no. uh, well, the Please people on the evaluation committee actually aren't here. I might be on that committee, but I'll give you a quick update to say that um, they're meeting tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would be the update. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and update on the superintendent's search. Well, the update is that the search is over. <laughs> yes. yes. As, um, as as was announced in the press release and to the school community, uh, the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools have engaged Elizabeth Bonesteel to be the superintendent of the Montpelier Roxbury Public School District starting July 1st. 
and we're all very excited to be working with her. That is the update. Unless someone has something else, I would entertain I move it. to adjourn. Motion. Thank you. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. We're done. Thanks, everybody.